All right. Thanks, everyone, for coming by. I mean, this is uh, it's great that you could make it even after the semester is officially over. So uh, it's a pleasure to have James give the last talk of the semester. I'm happy that it's happening in person. So he is a second year student, uh, med medical student uh, here at the U. And uh, uh, he has done a BS and MS at NYU uh, at uh, BYU. Uh, with an <laughs> emphasis, sorry, <laughs> with an emphasis on uh, cellular and neu neuro electrophysiology. I, I have no idea what it means, but I'm very curious to see what he has to say because this is a topic, of course, of great interest of uh, to many of you in ML, like uh, the sort of leveraging unlabeled data as an important theme. So seeing it in this context, I'm sure will be very useful. So so with that, uh, yeah, let's uh, James, please yeah. go ahead. Awesome. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it, especially at the end of a semester. Um, so let's get this going. So like I said, be talking about leveraging unlabeled data for machine learning in the electrocardiogram. Um, and a, a, a brief background on myself, like you said, I have a degree in neuroscience, uh, both undergraduate and master's degree, and my graduate work and research time was spent in cellular neuroelectrophysiology. So my graduate work there, I spent a lot of time doing cell recordings, um, the electrical recordings, but also our research group did lots of other types of data analysis. So we were doing imaging and rodent behavior and um, even like auditory analysis of rodent squeaks, right? So we started getting these really big data sets um, from lots of different animals. And as a grad student, I, I quickly realized the need to learn some data science skills um, and eventually some machine learning, which really led me down a path where I fell in love with machine learning and got really excited. Um, and so when I was fortunate to be accepted at the University of Utah as a medical student, um, I was really excited to come and try to um, gain some more formal knowledge and experience in machine learning specifically, um, but also um, applied to the medical setting and, and things that I wanted to do with the rest of my career. So I was really fortunate to start working with the cardiac electrophysiology group um, here at the University of Utah that includes people from the CBRTI and Scientific Computing Institute and, and lots of different people. Um, and that's kind of a big theme that I wanna talk about with this project is that, you know, this is hopefully um, taking a step towards applied machine learning in healthcare. And it really requires huge collaboration between engineers and scientists and, and math um, mathematicians, as well as clinicians and people who can bridge that gap. So it's, it's been a really fun experience. So right as I was getting involved with the cardiac electrophysiology group was kind of this first semester of medical school. And we had just started diving into normal cardiac electrophysiology um, from a clinical perspective. And so I'm guessing most of you don't have a ton of background besides, you know, Jake and Rob here up front on cardiac electrophysiology as a whole. So I wanted to give just a quick, uh, a, a quick introduction on what this looks like, why we care about it. So the heart has four chambers. Um, electrical activity um, starts um, in the top part of those chambers. They're called the atria. Um, and it propagates down. And as the electrical signal propagates, it's what causes the mechanical contraction of the heart, as we know that will pump blood through our bodies. And so we can watch as the signal propagates down through the atria, kind of down this middle um, septal region, dividing the bottom two um, compartments called the ventricles. And then it propagates back up, causing ventricular contraction. And that causes blood to then get pumped out to the rest of our body. So this is electrical activity at the heart surface, but we can record the electrical activity on the heart surface from the body surface, of course, with some smoothing as the electrical signal propagates through tissue and, and whatnot. And so the way that we do this is that we have electrodes placed on the body surface um, and they can measure um, the electrical propagation of the heart across different measurement vectors. And so you can imagine that by having different um, measurement vectors across the body surface, we can have different perspectives on this electrical propagation of the heart itself. And that can give us clinical insight into electrical heart propagation that might be clinically impactful um, as well as maybe some mechanical issues that can, can affect that as well. So a body surface recording has some really typical morphologies that we look at. Um, these were things I was taught as, you know, a first year medical student, um, we have a P wave here, um, and this is generally correlated with atrial contraction in isoelectric region, followed by this QRS complex, 
which is generally associated with ventricular contraction and atrial repolarization. Another isoelectric region followed by um, a T wave, which is generally associated with ventricular repolarization. And so this represents kind of a, a typical cardiac cycle. And um, yeah, fill that in there. So I just want to go through really quickly and give you an idea of the types of things. What does an ECG look like in, a, in the clinical setting? What are physicians actually looking at? So here's a healthy ECG. And you can note the organization here um, where, you know, we talked about our different leads that we had previously. You can see them identified on the sheet. One, two, three, right? Um, these leads on the left, which are measuring in this axis, are known as the Eindhoven leads. Um, and then we can see these other leads, V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, displayed over here on the right. These are measuring this kind of axis coming out of the body and down around the heart surface like this. These are called the precordial leads. And you'll notice that we can identify some of those waves and morphologies that we talked about previously. So you can find a P wave, QRS complexes, T waves. Um, but you'll also notice that for some of these leads, um, the morphologies look a little different than they do on this nice little cartoon. And that's because they're being recorded from different measurement vectors than this one is. So for example, the best thing to look at here is this AVR, right? So this is this image is showing inverse AVR. So the actual AVR lead is measuring this direction, right? And so the, 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 the heart electrical conduction is actually moving in the opposite direction of this vector of measurement. And so we can see here that our QRS complex is deflected in the opposite direction as some of these other ones, but that's a totally normal finding here based on what we're measuring. And so what I, what I kind of want to get an appreciation of is that these different leads are telling us, um, can tell us different things about um, the heart and have slightly different perspectives. So here is a different one and immediately kind of a change jumps off the page, which are these, um, elevations in this ST segment. Um, and you can see it, you know, if you looked at a healthy one and this one right next to it, even um, me as, as I was learning this task as like a first year medical student, I could say, I don't know what that might be, but something seems wrong about that. Um, and so this ST segment elevation, colloquially, we might call this a heart attack. So this is um, an example of an ECG from a heart attack. Um, but we can also look at um, other things that are associated with ST elevation. For example, these are smaller ST elevations in lots and lots of different leads. Um, and so based on this in the clinical presentation, this one ended up being a case of pericarditis or inflammation of the heart sac itself. And so even though these are both cases that, you know, were given to me as a first year medical student to say like, hey, these are quite obvious, you know, even at that level, um, you know, there's still a degree of complexity. And you can imagine that as, as physician training continues, um, the actual interpretation of ECGs becomes quite a complex and very like a high skill oriented task. You need to look at a lot of ECGs and really gain a lot of experience to be able to do this um, really, really well and consistently. So here's another example of, you know. So, so, um, so James, can I ask you a question? So, yeah. so in all these things you're showing a bunch of different leads, so I think, are different readings. Are those of, over each kind of three heartbeats, it looks like? Is that the same patient over the same time period, but yeah, measured correct. from different angles? So, yeah, so, so you can see yeah. you can see in a couple of them that there's something going on, but others of it, it looks maybe normal. Is, is that the right interpretation? Yeah, exactly. And it's important to recognize that, you know, not it's, this is one snapshot of one patient with all these different leads. Um, but also throughout time, you might take, let's say a patient is in the hospital for a heart condition. Well, we might take an ECG every day and there may be an evolution of how that's presenting over time. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so, um, looking forward, we can look at, you know, other ECGs where once again, from baseline, this kind of sawtooth pattern really jumps out at the beginning and seems quite obvious. And this is an example of an arrhythmia called atrial flutter. Um, but once again, kind of jumps off the page. Um, but then we can find other things that are more complex um, where we can look at these and say, well, there's a P wave and a QRS and T wave. So morphologies are looking okay. And you know, what's, what's going on with this one? And um, this one ends up, if you look at the just the very tip of this QRS complex in some of these leads, you can see this scooped feature. 
Um, and this scooped QRS uh, kind of feature is characteristic of a disease called Wolf Parkinson White, which is another type of arrhythmia. And so, you know, once again, these are ECGs given to me as, as, uh, as I'm learning the process to say, hey, these are the really clear ones. And you can imagine that doing this in the real world with patients that may have more complex features, um, the signals become quite subtle and, and it's a complex skill set. So in practice, this means that successful interpretation of the ECG, um, you know, we can do it, right? they're effective clinically, um, but it's impacted by the type of disease we're looking for. So the ECG has different sensitivities and specificities for lots of different um, conditions and they tend to be highly variable. So the one I always like to talk about is ischemia detection, which is thought of as being like a, you know, a relatively easy task in the ECG, um, but the sensitivity is around 50 to 70% um, and the specificity between 70 and 90%. So there's this kind of broad um, variability in the ability to do this. And, and that changes by different disease. You can also imagine that it changes by different specialty. If you're a cardiologist, an electrophysiologist, you've spent lots and lots of time um, looking at this and looking at really specific conditions and localizations. Um, but if you're in a specialty that doesn't use ECGs quite as often, your skill set is going to be different. Um, if you are an ER physician who also look at lots of ECGs, you're probably going to be focused on conditions that are going to kill you really quickly because that's what's most important that you recognize. And so your training kind of dictates your skill level as well as what you're trying to pick out of the ECG and it contributes to that variability. And then finally, we're never looking at ECGs in a vacuum. We're always looking at them in the context of a patient presentation. And, um, you know, once again, the, the ECG is really just a snapshot of someone's disease. And it also captures not just what's happening right now, but what may have happened previously. And so you might look at an ECG and say, well, I see this morphology, but really that's because 10 years ago, a patient had an event that left a mark on their electrical propagation, but may or may not be relevant to what's happening now. So um, ECG interpretation is complex, but we do it clinically and, and it can be impactful. So the reason that these are such a good candidate um, is not just that they have complex signal analysis, right? We all love complex signal analysis, but we love it even more when we can collect lots and lots and lots of data um, and try to maybe make that a little bit better. And fortunately, the ECG is collected all the time. It is, you know, it's considered a standard tool in medical practice. It's at any hospital. Um, it's used around the world. Um, we estimate that in the University of Utah, when I just look at our stream of ECGs that we get, somewhere between 100 and 200 ECGs every day are recorded here. So we're taking a lot of them. But there's also other types of non-invasive recording that are becoming increasingly used. So kind of on the far technical end, we can look at things like body surface potential maps, which are similar to ECGs in that they're non-invasive surface recording, but they can have you know, upwards of 200 leads on the body surface. So taking really high resolution non-invasive recordings. But then kind of on the far other side of that, we can look at at-home uses where you know, the Apple Watch is taking these single lead non-invasive recordings or companies like AliveCore and others who are developing non-invasive recording devices that are taking um, electrical recordings. So there's been like this a large advent of non-invasive electrical recordings being used at lots of different times. Yeah, please. Obviously the clinical one will be very accurate and compared to the other person all these things. Because they are not attached directly to the places of the body. Right. Yeah. There's definitely variability in, um, and, and I certainly, I won't claim to be the expert in how good the Apple watch is at making recordings. But with that said, um, you know, companies like, uh, AliveCore and other people like that use remote monitoring systems, um, sometimes in the clinical setting, um, when it's like, Hey, we have a patient, we think they have an electrical, you know, system problem. We need to send them home, but we want to monitor this activity. So there's certainly like a place in clinic for, um, you know, lower dimensional, um, recordings that we're still collecting and still have clinical use. Yeah. So these are becoming, especially the ECG is extremely ubiquitous. And so um, when you hear that there's complex signal analysis and we're collecting lots and lots of data, um, at least for me as someone who kind of fell in love with machine learning, I was like, man, this seems like it could be a candidate for me to do some machine learning. Um, but what are the goals, right? We, oh yeah, please. I just think in a 
all of these used to be partly taped in a computer, like some digital format, computer digital format. So that was one of our first questions. Um, because if you look in the hospitals, um, in their medical record system, they're saved as essentially images, but not the raw data. And so we actually had to dig, yeah, no, I, yes, that's the right response. Um, we had to dig back into the company that actually builds the machines that do the recordings, and they store a database of the raw signals themselves in a legacy database system that has not been updated in a very long time because they never anticipated that people would need to get the raw signals out. Um, and so that actually became a huge part of our project was actually extracting the raw data um, from the, the MUSE system and then making it so that we could match it to our EMR data. So before jumping into ML projects, I try to do my best to say, do we really need ML here? What, what can ML bring here that other, you know, signal analysis approaches don't bring? Um, and I think there's a few things. The first one is the, the potential to automate um, mundane or difficult tasks, right? So there are lots of tasks where if you sat down and said, I'm going to train you on ischemia detection, you can find ST elevations, you can find these things. Um, and I wouldn't say they're easy, but a human can do them with some level of skill. Um, but is that the best use of someone with lots and lots of training's time? You know, perhaps we could build a tool that would allow them to spend more time on problems that they're better suited for. Um, and there are other opportunities for this, like in education, right? So if I am a medical student and I'm trying to learn from ECGs, it would be helpful to have a system that would allow me to kind of um, figure out what's going on with an ECG without having to have two or three cardiologists read it and give me this really high gold standard. Um, the second portion that gets me really, really excited is the discovery of novel signals. And we've seen this a lot in the last five years um, where people are predicting things out of the ECG that humans were not pulling out of the ECG previously. So there are models out there that are detecting age and sex and um, even things that seem unrelated to the heart, like liver cirrhosis status, so like liver disease. Um, things that are vaguely connected to the heart, but we've been able to predict out, I shouldn't say we others have been able to predict out of the ECG. And I think the discovery of these novel signals highlights that this is an area where we can really find signals that we didn't realize existed before um, that have potential for really interesting clinical impact. And then finally, it's developing tools like this and then allowing those to improve access, right? So whether this means that you're in a rural clinic or somewhere that doesn't have access to specialist care, but we can deploy a model that's going to let you have some kind of preliminary high-level expert analysis, that's very impactful, especially where the recording stuff or the recording hardware is available, you know, pretty ubiquitously. Um, but it also could mean just things like improving the quality of consults, where there is, there's a kind of interesting model out in the literature which can detect when an ECG, when the leads have been placed in the wrong parts of the body, right? So you could imagine if you don't read a lot of ECGs, you place the read, leads in the wrong spot, and then you perform, you're like, oh my gosh, this guy's really sick. What's going on? And you go get a consult, and the consult says you put the leads in the wrong position. Go do that, and the patient's totally healthy, right? So if we could, if we could improve the quality of our consults, right? It's kind of this other domain. So um, overview of how are people actually doing machine learning in the ECG? Um, when I first started doing machine learning, I came from images because that was really hot at the time, right? Was, um, and so um, I, I started with images and I started with tabular data and the kind of ECG has followed a very similar pattern. So we'll first talk about, you know, we talked, there are known features, these waves and morphologies that seem to be important for clinical interpretation, you could imagine that you could look at them in an ECG and pull them down as tabular features and then pass those through to kind of traditional machine learning models, logistic regression, um, you know, gradient boosted trees, k nearest neighbors, four vectors, lots of ensembling. Um, and for lots of problems, this actually performs pretty well. It tends to perform well for problems where we understand a little bit the association between these features and what's going on and less well on kind of novel signal discovery um, problems. Other advantages of this include that they tend to be computational. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, 
Oh yeah, so I just meant generally saying, um, so an example of this, um, you could say like, let's try to predict ischemia, right? Let's try to predict if someone's having a heart attack in their ECG. So we go through and pull out all of these features and then we try to predict heart attack or not heart attack, right? Um, but just using these more traditional machine learning methods. All right, does that answer the question? Awesome. Uh, yeah. Feature thing also, this is automated kind of thing, like extraction. So there, yeah, therein lies the rub, right? Is um, yes, to an extent. Um, the cardiac electrophysiology group has actually developed some software called Pfeiffer that kind of does some of this feature extraction. However, doing it at scale on, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or eventually millions of ECGs is not necessarily easy in ensuring the accuracy. So yes, to an extent, um, but that's still an open area of work to improve that process. Other questions on this? Um, the other thing that's really nice about the feature extraction is that it represents this really great way to inject expert knowledge into a model, right? If we can, if we can engineer really good features, then we know our, we're pointing our model towards something that's useful, um, or at least that we think is useful. And so on the other end of the spectrum, we look at deep learning approaches um, for the ECG. And a lot of these initially were inspired by image-like models, so convolutional neural networks. Um, and you can, you can imagine, right, you've got a 12 lead ECG, it's 12 things in this direction, and then there's time access, and you can kind of format that in an image-like shape, um, which can be fed into some of these convolutional neural networks. Um, and these have performed really better in the novel signal discovery tasks, where perhaps, um, in, in part, it's because we don't totally understand the features that are contributing, right? We don't understand, like, oh yeah, the QRS should really be involved or the P wave should really be involved. Um, but we give the deeper model the opportunity to kind of do the feature extraction itself. Um, and they tend to perform better on those tasks. And of course, with lots and lots and lots of data. Um, and then also there's, there's another subset of, of deep learning architectures that are inspired kind of by time series, which when I first came in thought intuitively, these have to be the best because they're time series and these are time series models. Um, and this exists in the literature, but I would say it's still developing. Uh, it's it's um, LSTMs are, have, have been done. There's a few transformers, um, but transformers haven't really kind of become the main mainstay of this yet. So these are obviously really good for non, uh, complex problems, lots and lots of data. Um, they tend to be computationally more expensive, um, but yeah, they're interesting. And then finally, there's kind of this third genre that I find really interesting, which are transformation approaches, taking the ECG and transforming it in some way um, that makes it useful. And then um, either using that as a metric itself, passing some features of this transformation into traditional machine learning models, or actually passing that transformation into a deep learning model. So before I arrived um, at the cardiac electrophysiology group, um, Dr. Good uh, had done some work with um, body surface potential mapping. So these were the super high dimensional electro, um, uh, the non-invasive recordings. Um, and so what he did was start by embedding those, um, started by embedding those really high dimensional recordings into a lower dimensional space using an approach called Laplacian eigenmapping. And so in doing so, he created this three dimensional space that when a heart underwent ischemia, we can see the purple out here is this space when um, the heart is healthy. And we can see that as the heart undergoes ischemia, so as it becomes more like a heart attack, right? There's less blood flow, um, that the shape kind of crumples in this lower dimensional space. And this yellow dot here represents a metric that was used to kind of quantify that ability, which ended up having really good um, predictive power at, at showing when something was in ischemia or not. And so, like I said before, in this instance, this metric was just an example of, we found a metric directly out of this transformation, which ended up being really helpful for interpretation. However, you can imagine that others who do these types of transformations, perhaps spectral transforms that make this more image-like, um, they can use this as a tool to feature extract, push that into machine learning, or directly into deep learning approaches. Um, so a little bit of all of that. So 
last summer, I also started working with some of these bottle body surface potential maps um, and trying to do a similar problem of predicting ischemic versus non-ischemic. And so um, kind of transform them by linearizing these signals and making it such that the QRS was kind of um, aligned on a lot of these things. So we gave it some structure and then fed that structure uh, directly into to a logistic regression model and an XG boost model. And we were able to achieve um, in, in the binary classification task of ischemic or non-ischemic, we were able to achieve an AUC of 0.99 in, for both of these. Um, and so this was great. We got really high performance doing this. Um, and then what we were able to do is we were able to then go back um, and kind of figure out which leads on the torso surface we seemed to be contributing most to this ischemia detection task and then retrain models using only you know the top 12 most contributing leads eight and three and we see some drop off here but however we still see that we get an AUC for this logistic regression of 0.97 um, and 0.94 for the XG boost um, and so this is kind of an example of how this idea of the transformation approach and taking advantage of the different um, aspects of how these architectures work together can lead us to um, good results that are also somewhat interpretable in, in a medical sense. Yeah, please. Uh, two questions. So first, uh, basically, uh, so obviously the, the sample which you trained on will be imbalanced because most patients will be not. So you, did you handle that too? Yes. Uh, secondly, uh, through just the medical application, I think not all cases are equally right or wrong because detecting somebody uh, who has a problem not having a problem is more valuable than detecting somebody who has yes uh, not problem as a problem because that will go to further review yeah so did you thought of this also while working on this problem yeah yeah absolutely um so this data set in particular came from an experimental data set where we used a large animal model and we're actually able to control um, the degree of ischemia and so our ground truth was based on okay we controlled ischemic versus not ischemic um, however, you're absolutely right that in the patient setting, um, we have to be conscious of models that make a decision and what the impact of that decision will be. Um, and I know there are groups who, for example, will differentially weight their loss functions such that it, even if the two diseases are both wrong, it will give, a, it'll give partial credit to the one that gets you the treatment that is going to get you closer to the correct treatment, right? Um, so absolutely, that's essential to consider, especially the closer you get towards clinical implementation models. Yeah. And uh, how accurate are like uh, humans on this sort of stuff? Are they usually? Yeah. So for ischemia detection in the ECG, so with a twelve lead, um, sensitivity fifty to seventy percent, specificity seventy to ninety percent. The problem is that with these body surface potential maps, right? So these are the high, high, high dimensional recordings. For a human to go through and look at all of those, there are probably people who would be super accurate, but there are also those who would say, I don't, I'm not going to do that. Um, and so I think um, part of the purpose of this was one, to see if we could use some machine learning to make this um, a little bit easier to do, but then also to kind of speak to, hey, machine learning can improve um, this generally in electrophysiology. So. Yeah. Um, the technique of selecting some subset of the nodes. Yeah. How did you prioritize which ones? Yeah. So by the weight that the deep learning model applies. Yes. Yeah. So actually, and that's part of why we chose logistic regression and XG boost is they have really well built out ways to kind of figure out the ones that are highly weighted versus not highly weighted. Other questions on this? Awesome. Thank you. Oh no. Hopefully this comes back. Okay. Very exciting. Okay. Okay, talked about this. I guess Chrome just decided it was time to crash. Okay, so now we had done this work. Um, 
with the body surface potential maps kind of in this experimental model. And during the time that we were working on this, we were also working on trying to really get all of our, oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can do that. Ah! What? Download it as a PDF. Yeah, I'll try that. On the internet. Oh, okay. Okay. I know. Yeah, where's that button? Anyway, so I'll give, I'll keep talking a little bit as this is going. Um, so while, while we were doing these experiments in the experimental model, we we're also spending a lot of time trying to um, get our own data set of ECGs out of view. Kind of all of those problems that I talked about earlier of like, yeah, it turns out we just have images in the EMR. So how can we, um, how can we get the actual raw recordings? Um, okay, so you have to screen share. Oh, okay, thank you. Yep. Awesome. And so as we were kind of gathering, um, we realized we were gonna be able to get this data, but it was going to be perhaps harder to get than we originally thought, like all good data science projects. Um, we started to talk about, well, what projects do we really wanna work on? We wanted to do something that was definitely clinically impactful, um, but also this was kind of our first foray and into doing this with like machine learning with you know patient ECGs. So we wanted to pick something that maybe had been done before that we could try to replicate at a high level. Um, but we also wanted to pick something that was going to have a lot of clinical labels. Um, and, and as you might imagine, you know, we've talked about how many ECGs there are. Um, the limiting factor in our data sets at this point is going to always be the labels that we can get. So initially we settled on this problem, which is the prediction of low ventricular ejection fraction. And so in brief, what this problem looks like is ejection fraction is a measure of how much blood actually gets pumped out of your heart, right? So blood comes into the ventricle, it gets pumped out, some percentage of it actually gets pumped out and another percentage of it stays in, right? And it's a measure that we use clinically, um, especially in patients who have heart failure. Um, and, and as this measure gets worse, it's going to lead to clinically worse symptoms. And we measure this by looking at an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound recording of the heart, uh, where we can measure ventricular size during expansion and contraction and estimate how much blood is actually going out. So there's been this problem in the literature of, can we try to estimate ejection fraction just from the 12 lead ECG? Um, and we framed this problem, and, and this problem has been framed in the literature as a binary classification of low ejection fraction versus normal healthy ejection fraction. And you know, once again, what's exciting about this problem is that there are people who have built models like this that are actually starting to use them in clinical implementation in their own EMRs. So this is from a review from a group out of Mayo Clinic, who this is their ECG AI dashboard that they put in their review. Um, and you can see they have models predicting things like age, low ejection fraction, um, and a couple other things. And so we thought this would be a good problem to try because it's actually it's, it's an ECG based model that's moving towards, um, you know, FDA approval and real clinical implementation on the broad scale. They've shown this in prospective studies and retrospective. So this is an exciting thing to try to replicate. So here's an overview of what our data set ended up looking like for this problem. Um, out of our MUSE database, 
um, we were able to extract 1.2 million ECGs. So this, is, this was really exciting for us. And this is all the ECGs from 2012 to 2021. We've now been collecting these in our system kind of in perpetuity. I think we're up to about 1.5 million or maybe, maybe a little bit less, um, but slowly growing in our numbers here. Um, so then we matched them. We found all the ones that might be a match to LVF data, which ended up being you know, 380,000. And then we limited it only to ECGs that were done prior to the echocardiogram, right? We're trying to predict um, ejection fraction, not the effects of having a low ejection fraction after the fact, right? Um, and then we also limited it to um, ECGs that were done within 30 days of the echocardiogram. Um, so at this point, we ended up with about 64,000 ECGs. And then we found all the ones that we could actually successfully link ECGs to the exact um, ejection fraction data, as well as a couple other fields, and ended up with 41,655 ECGs from 25,000 patients. So this process took a long time um, and a lot of dedicated work from some excellent people at the University Hospital Data Science System. Um, and so this was really exciting to finally get down to this data set. Um, but we learned a few things about what this data set was going to look like and about doing these problems in the future. And the first was obviously labeling challenges. Um, it's interesting you brought up um, this imbalance issue. Um, data set imbalance is a huge problem. And in medicine, at least in my experience with this project, it's tended to go the opposite direction where we have more sick examples than healthy examples. Because as it turns out, we order echocardiograms for people that we think are quite sick, right? Um, and so we also introduced this other bias where maybe there are lots of people who need echocardiograms, um, but we're really only ordering them for sick people. And so we're gonna bias our model towards the detection of really, really sick patients and our healthy controls are gonna be maybe, maybe they're healthy or maybe they're moderately sick, right? And so figuring out what our labels really mean um, is, is really important. And then finally, actually getting this done, taking the data, getting our labels out of Epic is a hard task and it requires specialist knowledge. And so um, we needed to be careful in, in the future and think about, okay, what is the tasks that we really want to work on um, and, and make that happen? Um, I have some slides that I skipped in here. So I'll just skip over that for a second. Okay. So, First thing we tried to do, like I said, was replicate these results out of Mayo Clinic. And the way we did that is we took our 41,000 ECGs. We did a 90-10 train test split. Um, we did some scaling to put everything kind of in the same domain. And we also included some augmentations. Now, the augmentations were a really interesting part of this project because if you've ever done any work in image-based machine learning, augmentations are super essential, right? But the trick with images is that we can tell when we do image augmentations, like, hey, that's not a cat anymore. That's not a dog anymore. With the ECG, it's a little bit harder because we don't always know if we're distorting the signal past the point that it's going to be recognizable as the thing that we're looking for. And so we tried to pick augmentations that were robust enough that they would provide value to the model, but also that were um, limited enough that they weren't significantly changing the underlying signal that we were looking for. So from there, we chose to try to use Mayo Clinic's architecture that they had published. Um, and you know, we ended up having a similarly sized training set, although their, their test set was much larger. Um, and so we really tried to do as, as close as we could with our data to replicate what they had done. And we were excited because we were successful at that. So Mayo Clinic achieved um, an AUC of 0.9 and um, we were able to achieve an AUC of, yeah, it's not showing up super well, um, on the screen here, but um, an AUC of 0.89. So we were really close to approximating um, what they had done. And this was an exciting first step for us. And so we realized, okay, hey, we can do this. Um, you know, we've replicated this clinically impactful model. Um, and so from there, we started talking about other projects that we wanted to start working on and quickly realized that all of the projects that we were really excited about were gonna require us to use really small, relatively small data sets for you know, examples where we might only have 100, 500, 1,000 examples compared to our 41,000 that we used to train this model. And so we started to do some work to say, we know this model works and operates at a good baseline for a good standard. What happens if we start decreasing the amount of data? How much data do we really need to make this happen? And so as we did that, you can see here, um, the second bar at 50% of the data, we see a small drop-off in AUC. 
And as the data set continues to increase, uh, decrease, um, AUC also continues to, to drop off. And this is not a surprise, right? Less data, less powerful performance. Um, we expected this. And so for the next part, um, we really wanted to start trying to, we looked back and said, we spent all this time and we're really excited about this 1.2 million ECGs that we had. How can we really take advantage of all of this excellent unlabeled data um, to improve um, at our small data set tasks in the future? And so one way to do this is an approach called self-supervised learning. And in brief, um, you know, everything we've done up until this point has fallen under the umbrella of supervised learning. We have some model, we generate a prediction, compare it to a target, which lets us calculate a loss value. And this loss value can be back propagated to our model and that kind of formulates the basis of our optimization problem. And what we think is happening, at least in vision models um, during this process is that the training process at different layers helps extract different features from our data set. So earlier layers might be quite simple features and images. These are like, you know, different series of lines. Mid-level features might include things like edge detection and corners and then onto very complex features like wheels and shapes and noses and whatnot. Um, and this is uh, some, a really classic paper from 2013. So self-supervised learning looks at this and says, okay, well, what if we can separate our feature extraction task from our downstream task that performance that we really care about. And so what it will do is take some initial task using either cheaply labeled or completely unlabeled data and use that task to perform the feature extraction and then reinitialize this model with the, with the features learned from the first task and then see if that can help us perform the second task. So, um, in non-contrastive, uh, there's kind of two subsets of it. We'll start with non-contrastive. In non-contrastive learning, um, we used really cheaply labeled data. So data that was collected in theory, along with essentially every other, um, every ECG, um, to see if we could use that in a training process that would help us downstream to predict uh, ejection fraction. Um, so the first task that we tried was this feature normalcy task. So this was, you know, kind of came out of previous work that I had done with this. Um, you know, this tabularized data thinking, okay, how, you know, how can I facilitate feature extraction, right? Well, maybe we should point the model at features that we think are relevant. And so um, with every ECG that comes out of the Muse system, we have some, basically their hardware has like a black box algorithm that says, hey, we estimate that this is the QRS. We estimate this is the P wave and the T wave, right? Um, and it gave us some of these values. And so I said, okay, well, what if I just look up the normal values for those heights and, and distances and use those as uh, the features that we're trying to predict as, is it normal or is it abnormal? And so, you know, use a cross entropy loss with that um, and use that as our initial task. And um, when we did that and then compared it with the downstream task, um, it didn't perform very well. So we tried two approaches, one where we fine tuned the models, only allowed the final layers of the models to be updated by our downstream task. And then also just initialization where we allowed all models to be, or all layers to be updated by our um, downstream task. And what we found is that um, with the fine tuning, it performed extremely poorly, right? So it basically um, was random guessing down in here. Um, and with the initialization, um, it essentially never outperforms random initialization at baseline. Um, and so for the feature normalcy, there are a couple reasons that I think this may not have worked. And they're, I think they're important to talk about. The first one is that the way that we generated our labels of QRS and P wave and T wave, right? We pulled this from the Muse predictive hardware rather than using the software we had developed here at Ski and going through a really rigorous process of labeling normal and abnormal for each of these. We kind of used what was baseline coming out of the ECG itself. The quality of those labels may or may not have been high. It's hard to validate, um, but to go through and actually label each of those feature normalcy values quite rigorously replaces one expensive data set labeling task with another expensive data set labeling task. So it doesn't really solve our problem for us. Um, yeah, and then the, yeah, well, we can move on to the next one. So then the next thing we tried was to detect sex. So um, with almost every ECG that we get at the hospital, we can almost always link it to the sex of the patient, or at least what is inputted into Epic as the sex of the patient. Um, so we did the same thing here, trained it as a binary classifier and used the same architecture that we used previously. 
And this one got us really positive results. So we were able to, with 50% of the data, we were able to achieve a slightly higher um, AUC using our initialization approach. Um, and interestingly, if we used 100% of our data, so if we used um, all you know, 41,000 to train our model, and then we, in the sex detection task, and 41,000 to train it in the downstream task, we saw an improvement in AUC from 0.89 to 0.96, approaching 0.97. And so we saw this large jump in performance. And what that tells, what, what I hypothesize about that is that our sex detection task is actually facilitating useful feature extraction for this downstream task of detecting ejection fraction. So this, oh yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I, so in the downstream task, anything related with like female or male having Oh. Is it the correlation? Well, I'm trying to understand yeah. why this task will be related with the disease, uh, which is there. Yeah, I haven't looked at the comparison of, you know, in our data set of male versus female, um, what the balance of that is. Because you could, I guess you could expect that to be a reason. I That's really worth looking at. Thank you for asking that. Another thing I would add to that is that my hope, well, it may not be true, right? This is a kind of machine learning theory hope, is that there's something about this task that requires looking at complex features and that similarly complex features are also necessary for this other downstream task. But that's hard yeah, to quantify. Yeah, that's true. But if there's a, some profounding thing between like more samples of this other, then it might be mixed, like correlating wrongly in the task. And then yeah. maybe that, that could also be one thing. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for suggesting that. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's an excellent suggestion. Yes. Other questions on that? Oh, yeah. Really quick literature search. So far, I haven't found anything that suggests that sex is connected to higher or lower incidence of heart failure or ejection. That's that's absolutely worth yeah. doing and verifying. So thank you for asking that. Yeah. If the data set is skewed, that's not valid. But if it's physiologically skewed, then that is a valid. Then yeah. 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 Valid and confounding. <laughs> yeah, valid and confounding. Yeah. Also, like if you can get something intermediate, like in the representation visualization or something, I don't know, like keywords for a lot of visualization. Yeah. Yeah. That might also help in basically doing like what is feature, how the features are changing. Yeah. So, so some professor design and all these some kind of like visualization of mm -hmm. features. So mm -hmm. that could be interesting. Like after yeah. this task training, what exactly the feature are changing, like what why, and then mm -hmm. maybe looking at the samples which have a disease and which doesn't have a disease. Right. That's like yeah. a more clarity. Yeah, and I also have like some thoughts about like, you know, clearly it's not working very well with fine tuning, but it does seem to be working with this initialization. And so is it that is it that it's learning features or is it just that it's learning an initialization space that's a little bit better? You know, it's, it may not be strictly speaking the features, but just something about how it initializes is different. So I've thought about maybe doing experiments of like um, having differential learning rates across different layers to see how that affects like performance to say, oh, look, this layer, if we, if we change this layer a lot, it stops working. Or if we leave it the same, it stops working. And that might suggest that. Adam. Yeah. Mm. But, but yeah, but keeping an eye on what it is doing to those might be useful. Uh, I mean, yeah. 
but, but I think I suppose Adam by default says that you don't need to think of having different learning rates for each of them. If, if it does it by this, I mean, if it's in a particular rational system, but I, I mean, if it's SVD, then maybe it's worth. Yeah, and I guess, and, and maybe this is wrong. My thought had just been from experimentally to say, if I go in and manually alter that, what effect does that have? And it might suggest, oh, you know, this really learned features that are important because if we change them, you know, it disappeared. Um, but I don't know, there's certainly more thought there. Um, I guess, uh, first observation, can you explain why for fine tuning, the more data you added to the training set, it seems, doesn't seem to improve anything at all? Uh, why the baseline and initialization work pretty well? Yeah, I, I've been scratching my head about the same question of fine tuning in lots of machine learning context works really, really well, and it's just not working here. Surprise, like some of them is even like derated. Right. Yeah. So I don't. Just like, so, like, how do you um, split up your training set when it's like 5% is that randomly select from the actual data set that you have? Yeah, so it's um, so I did the train test split. Test set is always the same. Train set is always the same. And then I take um, it's the same it's the same five percent or ten percent every time. So I just have like cutoffs across the the training set that I use. So the bottom five percent is always the same. Bottom five. Yes. To try it out. Same thing in our own. Yeah. That and I guess when you split those, um, do you consider like splitting? Those based on the label, even though you know you have inbound label, right? You could take like two, like let's say one percent, you could take forty five percent of one class and forty five percent from the other class, mm. because with that you have like more similar replication of labeling, even though it's inbound, but it's across. So because yeah. what could happen is maybe when you take the bottom five percent. Um, it could somehow uh, balance and help your model work. Yeah, maybe yeah. for some reason you got really unlucky. Yeah, and the yep. bottom fifty percent. Yeah. Are yeah. all of one class. Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense, and that's um, I should, <laughs> I should, I should give that a try just to to see what's going on with that. Yeah, thank you for the suggestions. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's also on my to-do list of, yeah, and it comes back to the clinical impact, right, is did we say that this person has low ejection fraction, but it's actually they're right on the edge, right, and they're, they happen to be healthy, but they're really close, or are, are we really making huge errors, right, and we don't get that with the binary free cloud, so that's on my list of to-do as well, so thank you for bringing it up. Um, yeah. One, one question for this uh, ejection fraction. Uh, you phrased it as binary classification task. Is there a reason that you chose that rather than a regression? Yeah, truthfully, true. Yeah, so truthfully, um, I tried to mimic what had been done previously, um, just for the sake of wanting to have a really good baseline and right, like really comparison for these experiments. Now, in practice, I tried this as a regression problem and it did really poorly. And I don't know why. And I didn't spend a ton of time on it. So it may be that with more work, because a regression problem would be better, right? If we could just say, like, hey, this is the actual percentage, that's clinically way more useful. Um, regression tends to be with a bit harder. Yeah, yeah, right. With the uh, binary labels, you can do on the continuous space, it's harder to optimize. Right. Um, so I think that's a really interesting problem. Um, and I mean, and yeah. the other clinical reflection is that at the end of the day, the decision is to put an implantable cardiac defibrillator in a patient or not. Right. There is so, a so fine yeah. And it's not, it's not like one of these things where we're going to increase the dose of their medication by a little bit. Okay. That's not the clinical move. It's are they at risk? And if their rejection fraction drops below a threshold, then they're considered at okay. risk and they get it right. So, so, so it, 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 I think does map the clinical world. Yeah. In some ways. Yeah. I know we're almost out of time here. Um, I have a whole little bit on contrastive stuff, but should we try to wrap up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're, we're at. Okay. Right, so, back. yeah, really, really briefly, what I'll say is work in progress. Um, what we're trying to do now is, um, and I'll just skip ahead through some of these. 
um, is using more contrastive learning processes where we don't need any data labels at all. Um, and so trying to use these contrastive processes that learn differences between different leads, between different times, between different patients, using that as our initial pre-training task, and then having that be the basis for the feature extraction. Um, spoiler alert, we're still working on it, hasn't gotten it to work yet, but that's what my current work is. And hopefully um, next steps are to further develop our contrastive approaches while now actually using our 1.2 million to see if we can boost performance on our ejection fraction task, and then start working on exciting small data set problems that we've been trying to gather labels for um, that are super novel and haven't been published yet and are quite exciting. So yeah, thank you. Great. Oh, really quickly, yes. huge thanks to everyone. Um, this has been a huge interdisciplinary project. Um, so between clinicians and, and SKI and KEG and hospital data science um, and graduate students, it's been such a learning experience to collaborate with everyone and has really been a highlight of my time in medical school so far. So thank you.